So that right there is, is, is how you selectively focus on the large animals at the top of the food chain, is by destroying their habitat. And I think what we're seeing is that 12,000 years ago, there was a large amount of habitat that was destroyed. The open. So the previous extinction that was that severe, are you going to go back to that? Oh, Wait. thank you for keeping me on track. The, the pre, to go back, to find an extinction event at least as severe as the one of 12,000 years ago, you have to go back at least 3 million years. KT battery. What? KT battery. No, that was 65 million years ago. And I just said, I'll repeat what I said, is that the KT event that took out the dinosaurs was several orders of magnitude more destructive than the event of... Had an event equivalent to the Cretaceous tertiary event happened 12,000 years ago, the human species would not be alive on Earth today. It's that simple. But we are alive on the Earth. And, but this is not to say that the human species was not severely and dramatically affected by the same events that took down the woolly mammoths or the mastodons. The mastodons had inhabited North, North America for, for at least three million years. Yet whatever happened 12,000 years ago took down the mastodons. It took down these great Pleistocene camels that roamed over the southern United States. It took down several species of horses that, that don't exist anymore. It took down the great cave bears that could weigh up to 2,000 pounds. Well, three million years ago, there was an extinction event, and five million years ago, there was an extinction event that may have been on a scale similar to the one of 12,000 years ago. But there's a big difference between three to five million and 12,000. So what we're saying is that the event of 12,000 years ago was, is, was the most extreme event to transpire on Earth in, in three million years, at least. So that puts it right up there. But it was not nearly as severe as the 65 million year ago event. Because the 65 million, if something equivalent to the 65 million year ago event that took out the dinosaurs that happened 12,000 years ago, probably all of the species of animals, over 100 pounds in body weight, except perhaps crocodiles, sharks perhaps, would have, would have gone extinct. There wouldn't be moose or bear or antelope, or zebra, or giraffe, or wolves, or coyotes, or go down the list. There wouldn't be any of those. There wouldn't be humans. 100-pound roach. 100-pound roach, maybe. <laughs> so 3 million years ago, is that Pliocene? Uh, yeah, Pliocene was 3 million You're years gonna ago. You're going to have to get your timeline back out so people can, can relate to that. Again. Yes, I, I should. I did. You know, some of you may remember about a year ago, I handed out a geological timeline. And then I, when I handed out, I said, anybody who would like this, make sure you bring it every week mm -hmm. so that when we're talking about it, we can refer to it. But since you didn't bring it, I know that that means you probably memorized it. So. <laughs> you can get it on his website. Well, you can. Your website? I'm putting the, I've got a bunch of timelines up on the website now that, that are right out of my PowerPoint show. So any of you guys could go there now and look at it. What is your website? cosmographicresearch.org. I think I've got a card I'll give you okay. with that on it. With. Okay. Here's the mastodon, and I like mastodons because they were really prevalent here in Georgia. This was one of our native species of 12,000 years ago, this guy right here. And there were thousands of these things lumbering through the, the, you know, the forests of Georgia. This, and, and let's see, I think I've got for scale in here. Yeah, there, you can see it. Now, you know, this would have been pretty interesting times to think living in Georgia to have creatures like this wandering around. Which one? What? <laughs> that's one of, that's a late Pleistocene troglodyte. <laughs> that looks like Randall with a stick. <laughs> with pink paint? Before my, before my beard turned gray on me. But I don't look at that. I, that figure is just there for scale. <laughs> you're, you're looking at the, now see, look at the skull shape. Now see, let me go back a couple here. Let's see. Here it is. <clears throat> now on the left, we have the jaw of a modern African elephant, a large bull male. 
And on the right, we have the jaw of a mastodon. And this was from the philosophical transactions probably around 1800 or maybe even earlier. So this was a plate that was printed in, in the, the philosophical transactions of the American, the transactions of the American Philosophical Society, originally founded by Benjamin Franklin. And you'll notice elephant's jaw, look at the, the mass of the jaw. This jaw is actually considerably more massive. And then look at the teeth. Now you see, when, when they found these things, dug these up and looked at these jaws, they thought early on that they were finding the jaws of monsters. And that whatever this thing is, they looked at the teeth and they thought mistakenly that this was a carnivore, the jaw of some carnivore. It actually, mastodons are browsers, which means they like to eat tree branches. So their, their trees are actually, I mean, their, their teeth are actually oriented for eating tree branches. Unlike African elephants, which are grazers mostly, or, or as far as they're browsing, they eat leaves and they graze, but they don't eat branches. And mastodons ate branches. But when the, when the pioneers and the settlers and explorers began digging this stuff up, they thought it was carnivorous. They also didn't know it was extinct. So when Jefferson sent, when, when Lewis and Clark expedition went out, one of the things, one of their secret instructions was to try to find a living specimen of the great American incognito that this was called. And if it wasn't going to be too dangerous, they were supposed to, Jefferson wanted them to capture it <laughs> and bring it back because I think he wanted to keep it as a, his personal pet at the White House. Of course, it turned out that nobody ever found a living one because they've been extinct for at least 10,000 or 11,000 years. But it's quite interesting to think about the mindset of these settlers when they would be out, a farmer plowing, and this he digs this thing up and pulls it up and looks at it and thinks, my God, I found the jaw of a monster. And, and, and some of them, in early attempts actually to assemble skeletons of mastodons, they were assembling them upright as if they were, you know, these 20 foot tall, you know, humanoid. Yeah. I've seen. I, I, I've got to track down. I've seen a, a, a depiction of one of the misaligned skeletons where they've got it up on two feet, and it really does look like something that could have been a monster. And, and so, in 1800, there was a lot of people and educated people wondering: Were these giant monsters living out in the western wilderness? So, when Lewis and Clark set out on their their journey, you know, for all they knew, they might encounter something like this. Like right out of, uh, you know, the, the, the voyages of Sinbad or something. What was the foliage that the mess, what type of tree was it that the... Uh, well, the I think they ate a lot of spruce trees because these, a lot of spruce forests were in Georgia in those days. The kind of forests you find are up like just north of the Great Lakes now. Are they, are they, are they sap yielding? They sap? Yeah, but I don't know if that... Yeah, I mean, I've not studied really in depth into the dietary habits of mastodons other than to know that they were mainly browsers. And that's, that explains their dentition, you know, their teeth profile as compared to the, to the African elephant. But you look at that skull, you know. Oh, and then let's see, can, if you look here, yeah. Now you'll notice how the skull is shaped and you'll notice right up here in this aperture there's probably the likely origin of the Cyclops story, is finding a skull of a mastodon and seeing this big forehead aperture and thinking it was a single giant eye. Of course, you know, the ironic thing is, is they really were, in a sense, monsters. I mean, can you try to imagine that you're hiking, you know, up along, you know, up by Dahlonega somewhere through the woods and then you turn around the trail and all of a sudden you're confronted by one of these things. It could be rather disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Ah, and here's one, sort of what one looked like with skin. Actually, he's kind of found, a cute, cute little fella, they, isn't he? They have found yeah. whole m mammoths. Have they found whole mastodons? No. With the skin intact? No, and the reason is, is mastodons didn't occupy the northern climates that allowed them to get preserved in permafrost. 
And here's a nice painting of a of a mastodon. This this could have been a scene in Georgia, twelve thousand years ago, thirteen thousand years ago, a half a million years ago. State animal. <laughs> what? State animal. Georgia the state, state animal. animal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of these, a lot of mastodons and mammoth remains have been found along the Savannah River. So obviously when the flood waters came and decimated them, a lot of the carcasses were carried down the Savannah River. A lot of them have been found in the detrital sediments off the mouth of the Savannah River by divers and so forth, undoubtedly washed out during some of the heavy rainfalls and floods that accompanied the end of the Ice Age. You can find, find their teeth a lot after storms on the islands down around there. Yeah. Oh, okay, and there's for scale. I kept Brad, I, come on Brad, get out of there man, don't get so close. <laughs> You're making me nervous. I get the shot. Yeah, anything for the shot, right? And in the new movie that's come out, you'll see one of these guys. I went. We went and saw the movie. It was okay. Yeah, it was okay. It was a little yeah. disappointing because you know I've got this totally you know picture in my head that you know the mammoths were impressive, you know, but the story. Hmm. Yeah. About how tall were they? Uh, were the cedar tooth at, at the show? Let me see if I've got a. No, okay, the saber tooths weren't that tall, probably four feet tall. Or four feet tall. Yeah, wait. Remember in the movie when somebody asked somebody, where did these gods come from in Egypt? They, they, the answer was some say they came from the stars, and some say they came from a land that sunk. I did catch that. Yeah, yeah. So he, he slipped something in there. Yeah. I noticed the director, Roland Emmerich, was actually listed as the first name script author, script writer. So I imagine it was mostly his idea, and he probably hired somebody to help him write a script. With some, what I didn't get was that supposed to be ancient Egypt. Yeah. yeah. So where did they migrate from to get there? I mean, what were they supposed to be crossing the Pyrenees? Or <laughs> they, they, they walked Pyrenees, forever, yeah. didn't they? <laughs> I don't know. I, I was trying to figure out if there was any ge geographic that, that was a realism to it. It was unless they were going to Kilimanjaro. Like there's some rain down there. I don't know. Okay. This was Arctotus, the giant short faced bear. Now, this guy here could actually make a grizz large grizzly bear look rather modest. And I've put in a. For scale. He gets around, that guy. Yeah. Now, <laughs> this this Arctotus was considered to probably be the most formidable predator of the Ice Age. Mm. And he was less a pre uh, scavenger than he was actually a predator. And he was very predatory. And he had long legs, which allowed um, him to run up to 40 and 50 mile an hour bursts. Oh, yeah. wow. If this guy was after you, you probably could kiss your ass goodbye. Which he did right after I kicked him. Yeah. He, he ran away at 40 miles now. <laughs> but you, you look at the size of the head on it. Well, Brad's are in the head. Bear. Well, well, we, all, well, we all know Brad has a big head. But, so compare With that the, hat, he needs a head. Yeah. <laughs> all you can do is climb up. Good riding. <laughs> and then there was <coughs> Versus Spalius, which was the giant cave bear. This guy was probably not as formidable as the, he was probably more like a, a modern day bear. He probably was more omnivorous, whereas the short, the Arctotus was exclusively predatory. He was built for running and for taking down prey. And they think that perhaps Arctotus might have been up to the task of like actually taking down a mammoth or a mastodon. This guy here was probably not quite so ferocious, but he was huge. Um, Those Charles are. Charles R. Oh, versus it's supposed to be Charles R. Knight. He was uh, did a lot of paintings back in like the 1920s and 30s for the Museum of Natural History. And I had a book, a stamp book of his paintings when I was a kid. And you would pull out the stamps and then find the right page and then paste them 
Yeah. And it was all Charles R. Knight paintings, and so ever since then I've really, I've loved Charles R. Knight's work. And I've looked for sources, I've not been able to find reproductions, which somebody needs, I found a few, rep like here, every reproduction I've been able to find with years of searching is, is in this slideshow I've got right here. This is, this is, um, forgot the other, there's two of them. Um, this is not Charles R. Knight, um, but the Smilodon, this is Charles R. Knight. So this, there's, there's two main artists of Pleistocene mammal life. And Charles R. Knight was one, and then the other guy, and I've forgotten his name, and he did this one, and then this was Charles R. Knight, and this is the other guy. Now this was your giant Irish elk, Megalos Megaloceros, and being chased down by a pack of dire wolves. Now I was really disappointed because this movie didn't have any dire wolves in it. Now let me put a human figure in here for scale, so you can see how big that doggone Irish elk was, and also look at the size of the dire wolf. You're talking about a 200 plus pound animal there. And can you imagine having a pack of those things tracking you? Mm -hmm. I've thought several times that perhaps dire wolves might have been the origin of the lycanthropy legends, the werewolf legends. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And you know, there's been some interesting research on why modern lions and mountain lions are afraid of dogs. Mm -hmm. They will, a mountain lion, it could easily take, take out a dog. It'll run from a dog. <laughs> Dogs will tree mountain lions in a heartbeat. And one paleontologist studying him said he thought it perhaps was genetic in the um, mountain lions is that back in the days when they were, you know, faced with dogs like that, the dire wolves. Let's take a closer look here. I mean, it gives you a sense of, well, really when you begin to appreciate the extent of the great predatory animals that inha we cohabited this planet with, you know, that's kind of what I was hoping to see more of in that movie that they just didn't even touch on. About three or four woolies, huh? <laughs> and then we have Panthera atrox, the American Pleistocene lion, Again, another inhabitant of Georgia. And for scale, let me see who we've got here. Me, okay. Look at the size of that lion. This, this was a lion that could weigh up to 1,500 pounds. They say at least minimum half again as much body mass as the largest modern African lions. I mean, you can see, let me get me out of there. And you see that the lion is as big as the darn horse that he's just taken down. Well, they had that, what was the name of that uh, cheetah? You know, they had a, uh, a larger form of a cheetah over here. Too. Yes, they did, and I think I might have a picture of one of those in there. Mammothus trogantherii. Mm -hmm. this, this, I believe, was the species of mammoth that they were depicting in the movie. Looks like. And there's a, there's a human figure for scale. A kid that went with me on one of my trips in here. But it just gives you the sense of how tall those were. There was one; they had one of these on display at Fernbank Museum about eight or ten years ago, and it was very impressive to stand next to that skeleton. They had a <coughs> 16 foot or 18 foot ceiling, and in order to have the skeleton standing up to its full height, they had to take <laughs> the ceiling out. I mean, it was huge, very big, very impressive. Actually, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna do a show on this Saturday night down in Avondale. Oh you've probably seen this. <laughs> but that gives you a sense that that's a thigh bone of a woolly mammoth. Yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. And there we go. Mammothus primigenius, the woolly mammoth, icon of the ice age. Now you notice all the animals we've looked at basically all went extinct at the same time. Mammothus imperator, this was the biggest of the woolly mammoths, the Mammothus, Mammothus imperator. What it wasn't quite as hairy as some of the others, what also known they, as the imperial mammoth. When did 
Didn't they change all this stuff to BP instead of uh, you know, BC? Well, it pretty much because BP means before present. Yeah. So when you're talking historical stuff, you still use BC because it's historical reference to the calendar. But it was getting too confusing to people because when you start talking about something that's, say, 100,000 years ago, where the say, even margin of error might be 2,000 years, it just seemed to, I guess they decided it just didn't make sense to, you know, if you're talking about 1 million BC, I mean, I think what they wanted to do was just reference it to the here and now rather than the... Then year zero. Yeah, so these are absolute, more absolute, whereas you don't have to make the mental adjustment. Well, when you read 10,000 BC, like the title of that movie, that actually means 12,000 years before present, mm -hmm. not 10,000 years. And lots of people still actually get confused over that. I'm sure it's not some of the political correct crap coming in that... Uh, yeah. You don't want no. Christ mentioned it. Oh, I don't know. I, you know, that, you know, maybe. I've seen some of those things where it says before the event. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I only use it because it's used throughout the geological literature and the paleontological literature, but still in the historical stuff, that when you're talking about historical events, BC is still legitimately used. Now, if you started changing it within historical stuff, I would definitely say, yeah, that would be done probably because of political correctness. <laughs> but when you're talking about the old kingdom of Egypt being, you know, 2200 BC, it's pretty clear what you're talking about. To anybody who knows, you're talking about 2200 years before Christ. But you still have to go and think, okay, 2200 BC is 4200 years before now. And here was one of the several species of giant woolly rhinos. This guy was big. Elasmotherium sibiricum. He didn't live around here. He was up in Siberia. There is a human figure for scale. He was like three times the size of a large modern rhino, plus he was hairy. The, the horn on his head is typically five to six feet long. So that was, he was a big, big creature. And then you had, let's see, I need to remember the name of this artist. I probably got it on one of the notes pages here. But this is Coelodonta, the woolly rhinoceros. This was the other species. He's, he wasn't as big as a Lasmotherium, but um, still would have been. If he was standing in this room right now, it would be an impressive sight. <laughs> but he was bigger than a modern rhino, bigger than a modern rhino, but not nearly the size of a Lasmotherium. And there's Smilodon, also known as the saber-toothed tiger or saber-toothed cat, stalking a Shasta ground sloth. There was at least three or four species of giant ground sloth. Oh yeah, and then there was bison, bison latifrons, the super bison, and for comparison, you can see how big that guy was, about double the size of a modern American bison. So. There were a lot of big animals during the end of the... fuzzy and big horns. Yeah. Well, that means when you got one, it would last longer. Yes, <laughs> no. Well, there must... Before that, that Ice Age onset, there must have been conditions present to allow these <coughs> these animals to evolve to that, that great of a size. Well, what seems to happen is that if you don't disturb the environment and, you know, all you have to do is mean, look, as we become, you know, better fed and more nutrition and so forth, I mean, humans are getting bigger. Yeah. You know, I mean, have you ever been to a Civil War museum and looked at the uniforms that they wore in the Civil War? You wonder, what were these guys, 14 years old? Yeah. I, I, I've been to a couple of Civil War museums, and, and I've not even remotely have ever seen a Civil War uniform that I could even begin to think about putting on. Or, or look know, at, look at the the Japanese, right? You're about to say how much the Japanese have increased in size in the last couple of generations? Actually, I was going to say how the Mexican, uh, the, native, the native Mexicans that come up here, I mean, they're much shorter, and I think it's because they, they, were, they didn't have the nutrition that, that we've had over the last 100 years. Could be. Well, if, if you leave a habitat intact, 
and to keep the food supply and everything and keep keep things stable, I think the natural tendency is that the species increase in body mass. And then you have a catastrophe. Like there were mammoths that survived the catastrophe at the end of the last ice age. They were called pygmy mammoths. Like they were found out on uh, Wrangell Island, I believe, and several of the islands off the coast of western Canada and Alaska. They survived in these isolated habitats, and one of the things they did because of a limited food supply is they shrank in size, and they were like only this tall, five, six feet tall. Well, when did they go extinct? Well, they went extinct probably only about five or 6,000 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Diornis maximus, the giant moa that lived on New Zealand until 800 years ago. Human figure for scale. Now that was not the bird in the bird. No, that was not the bird in the movie. The bird in the movie was this. Oh, there we uh, go. Fororoc I have a hard time saying this. Fororocos. Giant. See, now that was scientifically inaccurate in the movie. They had a Miocene bird 12,000 years ago, and no scientist has ever, no paleontologist has ever found remains of this guy with it, that are less than 2 million years old. He's a mean thing. However, for the sake of having some cool, vicious animals, I might have been inclined to put one in the movie just to have one in there. What was, uh, what was the, uh, like 35 or so maybe uh, miles an hour they could run? They could run pretty quick to Oh, yeah. Catch During them. the Miocene, birds were the top predators on Earth. <laughs> they were the top of the food chain during the Miocene, which... Um, you know, I think the Pliocene started, this was, this was up to about five million years ago, actually. So this is birds even older. Some of them may have survived into the Pliocene, which could have meant that they might have survived right down to the beginning of the Ice Ages around two million years ago in the Pleistocene. But, and there's how big they were. They could have obviously even easily bitten your head right off of your shoulders. Mammothus columbi, the Colombian mammoth encounters a smilodon, a scene that could be typical of the southeastern U.S. during the late Pleistocene. Hmm. And then we get to the mystery of what brought the Pleistocene to an end. And I think that you cannot talk about the, the climate changes, the rise in ocean level, the sudden melting of the ice sheets, in the extinction of all of these animals as separate problems as they do in orthodox science today. They're all dealt with by specialists who are looking at them within the narrow box that, there are, that it's a unique problem that, for example, the climate change that has been reg registered so clearly is not being considered. It's like third or fourth on the list of leading contenders for what caused the extinction of well, they don't even address most of the extinctions, but what they do say is that humans were responsible for woolly mammoths <coughs> and the extinction of the woolly mammoths. And you know what I think about that. Um, yeah, the cause of these... Of the, now, this guy here is honest enough to admit back 25 years or so ago that the cause of the extinctions is, extinctions is unknown. Um, and I think that Rembrandt Peale, one of our foremost early American scientists, friend of Thomas Jefferson, actually had it more accurate with his way of thinking 200 years ago when he said, how long since these animals have existed we shall perhaps ever remain in ignorance? Certain we are that they existed in great abundance from the number of their remains which are found in America we are likewise sure that they must have been destroyed by some sudden and powerful cause. Now, do you think that the sudden and powerful cause that decimated somewhere between 12 and 20 million woolly mammoths from, from England, across Eurasia, across Siberia, across into Alaska, in the southern United States, down through Mexico into South America, do you think that all those woolly mammoths were all hunted to extinction between 11 and 12,000 years ago by roving bands of Paleo-Indian hunters? How, how feasible is that? When you actually begin to look at it critically. 
I don't think it holds water. Well, in, in addition, when you begin to look at um, Rembrandt Peel, it is extremely probable that whenever and by whatever means the extirpation of this tremendous race of animals was affected, the same cause must have operated in the destruction of all those inhabitants from whom we might have received some satisfactory account of them. See what he just said? He said, well, whatever happened to wipe out the animals, if there were people around who would have preserved stories, they probably got wiped out too. Now, this is not an idea that's being seriously entertained by modern science at all. At all. And yet, it's almost certainly true that the human species had to have been dramatically affected. You don't wipe out half the top of the food chain on Earth without affecting the human species, for crying out loud. You don't raise sea levels worldwide by 400 feet without affecting the human species, particularly when you consider that probably the, the most thriving communities on Earth that time were coastal communities. Mm. You think about that. They're all 400 feet underwater now or if they were all along rivers, right? There's not a river on earth that you can't document that there were tremendous ice age, terminal ice age floods. All the watersheds on earth show evidence that they were completely overwhelmed between 10 and 12,000 years ago. Can, can they predict how fast that they flooded? Fast? Well, I mean, if we had like the, the Scablands show how catastrophic the, melt, the melting was, yes. and they, interpret that in terms of sea level rise, the speed of, of sea level rise? Well, see, here's the problem. We're just in the infancy of being able to document th these high resolution, with high resolution records that would actually allow us to go. All you can do now is say, well, it was here, and then a thousand years later, it was here. So what's, or, or here, and five centuries later, it's here. Now, all you do is you make a smooth profile and you assume that it's an average increase over that 500 years. The real scenario may have been completely different than that. It may have been one year, you know, or 10 years. Or if you get like this, the Scablands flooding into the ocean at a greater rate in a few weeks. Well, yeah, you could raise, now see, particularly if the Scablands flood was only one meltwater source issuing from the ice cap, which is what I believe. I believe you had equivalent meltwater flowing off the entire perimeter of the great ice complex. The reason it's so spectacularly preserved out in the Pacific Northwest is from the ice cap to the ocean, you had a short distance to travel over a very steep gradient. To get from the ice sheet to the Gulf of Mexico, for example, you had to travel about five times further over a much shallower gradient. So the total volume of water over time could have been equivalent, but it's not going to do nearly the work of erosion and deposition that this water coming off of, you know, traveling, descending 4,000 feet to sea level over the distance of Washington State. Like coming off of Wisconsin and Minnesota down to Mississippi, you had a descent of about 1,000 feet over 1,500 miles. Whereas in Washington State, you had a descent of 4,000 feet over about 500 miles. And that much steeper gradient causes the water to move with tre much tremendous more force and ability to spectacularly erode canyons and create giant gravel bars and things that you won't see in the Mississippi River Valley. But what you will see in the Mississippi River Valley is if you go into the tributary rivers coming into it, you can follow terraces up showing that water, while it wasn't moving fast like it was moving out west, it nonetheless was filling up the valley many hundreds of feet above the present floodplain. Hundreds of feet above the present floodplain. And half of the state of Louisiana was created by these great terminal ice age meltwater floods coming down the Mississippi River Valley and building this giant <coughs> delta down into the Gulf of Mexico. Most of southern Louisiana, the Bayou country, is only 10,000 years old. It wasn't there during the Ice Age. But with the great meltdown, all of this material sediment was washed down and created this giant delta that reaches almost up to central Louisiana. 
So, I mean, there was a huge amount of geomorphic work done on around the entire planet during this transition. Uh, I got a question. Okay. A request. Could you state what you told me about um, another reason why they did not hunt mammoths and mastodons? Because we see in modern present time that people do not hunt elephants. Well, yeah, I mean, the only, the only tribe in Africa that's known to hunt elephants, ironically, is the pygmies. And when they go on an elephant hunt, that's a major deal. They only go on a few elephant hunts a year. I mean, what on earth would, would roving bands of hunters, first of all, when you've got so many animals to choose from, so many grazing animals to choose from, and smaller animals, why would they go after exclusively the biggest, hardest animal to take down out of the whole... You know, a whole animal kingdom. I, can, I mean, some, I can see how somebody would have, but you know, if, it's, if you look for modern analogs, you could see a tribe of people perhaps taking down a couple of elephants per year. But beyond that, what reason would they? They couldn't consume the flesh. The flesh would just rot. I mean, what, what on earth are gonna, they going to be taking down so many elephants that they exceed the ability of the elephants to reproduce themselves? But you see, when we get to the... Uh, when we actually get to the circumstances under which we find mammoths, we don't find anything at all consistent with human hunting. Uh, the remains of the mammoth occur on the continent, as in England, in the superficial deposits of sand, gravel, and loam, which are strewed over all parts of Europe, and they are found in still greater abundance in the same formations in Asia, especially in the higher latitudes, where the soil which forms their matrix is perennially frozen. Remains of the mammoth have been found in great abundance in the cliffs of frozen mud on the east side of the Bering Straits in Something Bay in Russian America, 66 degrees north latitude. That was back um, in 1847, Russian America was Alaska. Oh. And they have been traced as far south as the states of Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, and South Carolina. It would thus appear that the primeval elephants formerly ranged over the whole northern hemisphere of the globe. Now notice the description of, they find the remains of elephants in great abundance in cliffs of frozen mud. Okay, now what would finding elephants' remains frozen into permafrost have to do with human hunting? Would somebody explain that to me? Not much that I can see. You know, and, and well, how would a carcass being hunted and presumably consumed by people then be end up frozen in permafrost? No, it was the, the act of burying them and freezing them that killed them. But the problem is, is the studies of the remains are disassociated from the actual extinction. So you can go through all of the literature, modern literature, about the extinction of the Pleistocene mammals, and what they don't talk about the circumstances under which their remains have been found. That basically has nothing to do with their demise as a species. But you'll notice, and Charles, you'll notice this, they're found in the superficial deposits of sand, gravel, and loam. <coughs> now, how did the sand and the gravel <coughs> and the loam get there? Floods. Floods, yes, floods. Almost invariably, not about 95% of the time, the remains of the extinct animals are found in flood deposits. One river, what was it? There was one river up there in, uh, in Canada. They found, they no telling how many bodies in that thing. It's in a curve of a river. Yeah. Now, again, back from 1847, this is from the American Journal of Science. I went and dug this up in an original journal from 1847. Found this. Um, here we have, from the same journal, 1847, he's talking about this explorer named Hedenstrom who did this survey of the, I'm not sure how you say that, Le Chao Islands on the northeastern coast of Siberia. And this is what this Hedenstrom says, that the first of these islands is little more than one mass of these bones. And that although the Siberian traders have been in the habit of bringing over large cargoes of them for upwards of 60 years, yet there appears to be no sensible diminution or diminishment of the number of these bones that are being dug up in these islands. Now again, 
if you have what appears to be an island and they go there and as he says that the first of these islands is little more than one mass of these bones. Now, again, you have these huge masses of these bones. What does that have to do with human hunting? What, what I mean, what kind of predators were they using helicopters and gunships to take these guys down? You know, I mean, how do you create a deposit that might conceivably have thousands of individuals preserved in? Um, this is interesting. This is from 1857, the Quarterly Journal of the G. I'm sure you guys have, probably most of you have read this, but <laughs> on the north side of the hills decline and form there, and there only a low pass, through which some years ago it was proposed to cut for the purpose of, there was a, there was a lake, and they wanted to drain the lake. So they begin to dig a ditch from the margin of the lake towards the mountain, and in the progress of the work, at a depth of about 30 feet below the margin of the lake, were found fossil bones. The first animal discovered was very near perfect, with the exception of the head, and at a small distance another skeleton was found of smaller dimensions. At the width of the drain, where the skeletons were found, did not exceed 12 feet, we may conjecture that, and this is an important idea, had the trenches been wider, more remains would have been found. May not herds of these creatures have been destroyed whilst feeding on what at that time was an extended plain? I am in inclined to this opinion from having found fossil branches of trees in the same trench with the animals. Now, these animals that he found, by the way, were mastodons. Now, this is an important idea that has been speculated upon like by a number of the earlier explorers. Here what they did is they dug a trench okay, through this alluvium to try to drain this lake. They dig a trench and they find the remains of two animals in the trench. So the guy is sitting there thinking, well, if we dug another trench over here, and we, within 12 feet we find two animals, if we dug another trench over here, would we find more animals? If we dug another trench over here, would there be more animals still? Well, in the cases where there have been multiple trenching episodes, or where there have been big spring floods, like with the melting of the, with the Little Ice Age terminating between 1850 and 1900 is one reason why a lot of these animals have been found. Is because with the melting of, with the, the termination of the Little Ice Age and the warming of the climate, you had a lot of very large spring floods. These spring floods would now erode the banks of rivers and streams. And every time, every year, when they would erode these banks, they would expose new, fresh animal remains that were buried into the soil. So the point being is that you might be on a whole area of ground, and you cut through one area, and you find several animals here. But if that's just a random cross-section, it means that there might be thousands of individual animals buried under the ground that have not been found. Um, wow. Yeah, some of this stuff is pretty darn interesting, and I'd like for you guys to read it more. But um, so the, this. Yeah. So finally, the question which remains is not the least important. It is to learn to what cause ought to be attributed the singular assemblage together of so many bones often accumulated in such large quantities that they are as plentiful as in a cemetery. And I've suspected for a while that maybe the sort of this, this idea that, that hasn't been proven, which has been disproven, that there are elephant graveyards. You know, if you remember some of the old Tarzan movies oh, yeah. where the, the elephant at the end would go to the elephant graveyard and die, well, the notion of the elephant graveyard probably arose from the discovery of these huge caches of, of mammoth and mastodon bones. Well, okay, let's... I will end this note with an observation of the illustrious physicist so recently lost to science. This would have been Baron Alexander von Humboldt, who was one of the first of the great South American explorers back in the early 1800s. Humboldt observes that when a phenomena is general and repeated under the same conditions as has been the case in the filling of the, the longitudinal, 
longitudinal and vertical fissures of calcareous rocks. Let's stop for a minute. He was exploring in limestone terrain, calcareous rocks. In the fissures, they found these deposits. Over and over again, they would find these deposits. Such a phenomena must have been produced by a cause as general as the effects which group around it. According to this double condition, which is presented in all caves where remains of animals of geological date are found, it is impossible to attribute it to any other cause than to violent inundations. In other words, here you've got this fissure in the rock. It might be 100 feet deep. 50 feet of it is filled with gravel, and when they start pulling out the gravel, all strewn through the gravel are animal bones. Or in some cases, the deposit in it may be almost completely animal bones. In caves, I've told you about the cave in eastern France that was discovered, or was it, I need to look up and remember the exact source, where they found the remains of thousands of cave bears. France. It was France? Yeah, That's thank you. That's big cave. Yeah. Um, Talking about here on the species of mastodon and elephant occurring in the fossil state in Great Britain from 1865 by the late Hugh Falconer, fellow of the Royal Society, MD, fellow of the, I'm not sure what, FLS, what that is, uh, discovered, he's talking here about the, the mammoths again, discovered fresh either in the frozen cliffs or in ice blocks at the mouth of the Lena. It has been traced through its osseous, means bones, remains in the superficial gravel beds over nearly the whole of northern and the greater part of central Europe. So what he's referring to is back in the 17 and 1800s, they were finding all over these gravel deposits, all over northern and central Europe, bones of extinct animals. And again, finding them in the gravel deposits. Uh, Geological Magazine, June of 1866, reporting on another specimen of Elephas primigenius. That's the, the big mammoth. The, it's been discovered in the Bay of Tazuskaya. The flesh, skin, and hair are said to be in a state of perfect state of preservation. It was discovered accidentally. A native in search of some domestic animals which had strayed perceived a great horn sticking up in the midst of a marshy moor. Wouldn't that be something to find out? You're going through a marshy moor, searching for some lost animal, and you see this big six or eight foot horn sticking out <laughs> of the... That would be so exciting. Um, let's just keep going here. Um, Henry Holworth, this was a man considered to be a wacko in his day, but definitely way more uh, accurate than his peers. The first thing that seems to follow inevitably from the facts is that bodies which are now found intact in the Siberian tundras have remained frozen since they were first entombed. We are not dealing here with animal substances deposited in bogs and changed into organic compounds, but a flesh so unchanged that it has all the character of that of animals which have recently died. When examined under the microscope, while it is readily eaten by wild animals that live on the tundra, while it is on the one hand clear that the ground in which the bodies are found has been frozen since the carcasses were entombed, it is no less inevitable that when these same carcasses were originally entombed, the ground must have been soft and unfrozen. You cannot thrust soft flesh into hard frozen earth without destroying it. Great carcasses of mammoths with the most delicate tissues, the eyes, the trunk, the feet, beautifully perfect, cannot have been forced down into ground consisting of alternate layers of ice and frozen earth. I want to know, in all of these findings and stuff like that, were there no human bones? Oh, there's, yes, I've got some reports of those, but no, very little. Which, again, doesn't support the idea of these animals meeting their demise as the result of a human agency. But yeah, there have been association of human bones with extinct animal bones. Um, then the mammoth trade, uh, the ivory trade, very interesting phenomena. It was not till the middle of the 18th century when a trade in ivory, in fossil ivory, was first developed on a considerable scale. 
This was largely initiated by the stores of mammoth bones discovered in 1750 by the merchant Liakoff. In 1770, this enterprising trader made his way to the island now bearing his name. Three years later, he again went northward and discovered the islands of Malloy and Kotelnoi, whatever, once he returned with a rich cargo of furs and mammoth bones. These discoveries induced the Russian government in 1775 to send a land surveyor to explore the islands more thoroughly. What do you think he found when he went to explore these islands more thoroughly? According to his report, the soil of the first of these islands is almost composed of fossil bones. And near it is a mud bank which exposes fresh ones with every storm. This made him conclude that a large deposit lay under the sea there. In one of these islands, we are told, is a lake with high banks which split open in the summer when the sun melts the ice and disclose heaps of tusks, mammoth bones, and bones of rhinoceroses and buffaloes. The ivory is, uh, is often as fresh and white as that from Africa. In other parts of the island, bones and tusks are to be seen projecting from the ground. The quantity of ivory which from this time found its way to the European markets from this source is almost incredible. Middendorf calculates that altogether not less than 110,000 pounds of fossil ivory go to market every year, representing at least a thousand individual mammoths. So that during the last 20 years, 20,000 mammoths must have been thus utilized. Nordenskjold considers Middendorf's calculation as too low rather than too high. The steamer alone, he adds, in which I traveled up the Yenisei in 1875 carried over a hundred tusks. The calculation is, in fact, very much too low. Um, I have a... This is what happens. This is what you see washing up along the shores of the rivers after particularly wet springs, when you have floods that erode the banks. This is what the banks of the rivers are largely composed of. Now again, when you look at something like this, I, I gotta ask, what on earth would human predation, human hunting, have to do with this? Nothing. We're not seeing the aftermath of human hunting here. We're seeing the aftermath of some kind of environmental and climatic catastrophe, catastrophe of the highest order.